move on to the second session uh by dr bhaskar mukherji and the topic is neurobiology of behavioral addiction to start the second session i invite dr naresh nibhani uh, nibinani he is an associate professor department of psychiatry aims jodhpur he is also the honorary editor of journal committee indian association of child and adolescent mental health and he has about 154 research items the next chairperson is dr gyaneshwar sharma can we have his slide please uh, can we have uh, sir slide ah dr gyaneshwar sharma he is the professor and former hod department of psychiatry rims and then genems both in imphal he is a retired professor of psychiatry mahatma gandhi medical college and research institute he also has a who fellow on the addiction and rehabilitation he has also been a who fellow for community psychiatry and published and presented various research papers in different national as well as international papers i invite both the chairpersons to uh, kindly join us on the dais i request uh, dr ganeshwar sharma sir to kindly introduce our speaker dr bhaskar mukherji in, in serious mental disorders publication more than more than than publish research paper uh, i request dr bhaskar mukherji uh, anyone to speak my go chair person shall i invite uh, dr bhaskar for to continue the speech present presentation If the coach or person has to talk, uh, I pass on to him. Let me share my screen. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. First, let me correct a few things. My interest is not biological psychiatry because biological psychiatry doesn't exist. There is no biological psychiatry. Psychiatry is biological. you haven't had biological nephrology you haven't had biological cardiology you haven't had biological endocrinology so why should there be biological psychiatry psychiatry is a medical subject and so by its place in medical field it is biological so there is no biological psychiatry psychiatry is biological every part of psychiatry is biological with this i would go to my presentation so my today's topic is process addiction and neurobiological basis as well as some part of its treatment first we have to understand what is process addiction i would go to process addiction via a roundabout way first i would explore where is actual addiction process then i would explore the neurobiology of total addiction process and from there i would try to explain what is process addiction actually in case you are wondering process addiction is the correct scientific name of biological sorry behavioral addiction so what is addiction addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward motivation memory and related circuitry though the circuitry is responsible for production of addiction addiction is actually also a neurogenetic disease it starts as neurodevelopmental trait and it manifests it 
in very early stage of human development yes there is another variant which happens after mid life but that is a different thing and i would talk about it later when the time comes so the phenotypical expression of drug use or phenotypical expression of overuse of any pleasurable activity is ultimately just a behavioral expression of this group of disease the addiction is actually expression the main disease is hiding inside the brain cells and, and their interconnection so how how this group of disease just a how this group of diseases are from in very basic what addiction develops when the neocortical reflective brain cannot inhibit the older reflective reflexive brain areas means our brain is actually the pinnacle of animal evolutionary system in brain yes people would argue that dolphin has more brain areas than us yes people would argue that our brain is not very different from many of the other anthropoid apes but where our brain excels is, is adaptability the adaptability of human brains is tremendous human brain can adapt to most of the environment of this earth be it tundra be it sub saharan africa be it anywhere it would find a way to adapt and evolve this is where our brain excels now for that different part of our brain needs to work in tandem now some part of our brain is reflexive it acts without consideration it these are this part is what forms our motivation our impulses and other things previously older neuroanatomists used to call this part mammalian mammalian brain or reptilian brain that's not true because that is a faulty way of representing it but still this reflexive part is common to most of the animals now neocortex is the controlling part of our brain it reflects it doesn't act reflexively it reflects it reflects on environmental situation and what we can do uh, decide uh, based on the various environmental inputs and then it decides what to do and what not to do so when the reflective brain that is neocortex cannot control the basal arches of older reflexive brain areas then we tend to overdo things and anything we overdo consistently is termed as addiction by society yes it's a very broad definition you would say so is someone who is highly dedicated is addict yes neurobiologically from brain's point of view that person is also addict but society accepts that person as normal because our concept of addiction is based on social ideas addiction addiction of psychiatry is not based on brain is not based on neurobiology is not based on neuropathology it based on social ideas that's why previous to 1800 century there was no addiction all the addict so called addictive substances all the so called addictive behaviors were common in 1800 uh, 1800 1820 and things like that pop opium used to be a drug of almost miraculous activity same goes for cannabis and various other addictive substances all the so called addictive habits let's say 
over use of sex was normal perfectly normal compulsive sexual activity for compulsive gambling was perfectly normal then society decided that these are the bad acts these are the good acts and uh, we started venturing into addiction and we created a mess out of it so when seen from brain brain's point of view overdoing anything chronically or repetitively is addictive so what are the actual motivation which makes a person do a thing repetitively they are together called reward seeking motivations they can be food water basic needs they can be social needs which can be social uh, sexual gratification which can be personal uh, attachment which can be playful environment and which can be artificial stimulation which is actually that so called drugs you see or anyone who has a genetic tendency to overdo things can do excessive food intake excessive water intake excessive food intake and that person would be called binge eating disorder that person would not be called addiction because society doesn't see that as that harmful what a wonderful thing for a medical profession then a person who has excessive drinking psychogenic polydipsia it, it has become a obsessive compulsive uh, related disorder it is not an addiction society thinks so where is brain here the basic need compulsive sexual act again this this is addiction this is obsession both society doesn't think so but brain thinks that personal attachment means excessive attachment to family member excessive attachment to various things and holding these are actually these are classified under obsessive symptom but from seen from brain point of view these are addictions too who excessive reading excessive gardening anything done excessively is personal attachment including excessive spirituality so today's gurus today's various spiritual enlightenment seekers they are in a way in a way addict to now playful environment playful environment means enjoyable activities so all the enjoyable activities is if overdone can be addiction so we call a person who is playing 14 to 15 hours and computer game addict why because society says so but we don't call a cricketer who is playing for 14 to 15 hours why because society says so where is biology in it where is science in it any any idea of science in uh, today's addiction psychiatry no addiction psychiatry is a morality and society driven driven branch there is no science in addiction psychiatry otherwise we we psychiatrist would have been the first person to resist gaming addiction because gaming is a profession now and this is a step for which we would have to apologize to future just like homosexuality anyway so comes the neuroanatomical considerations i would just skip to this i would give a schematic view because otherwise i would not be able to elaborate the area of behavioral addiction much so the brain areas involved in formation of addiction are almost every brain brain areas are involved because brain works in total there is nothing no behavior no thought no motor action that happens only singularly brain works in tandem in total in everything 
but the following brain areas they are more involved in maintaining of addictive trait these are basal ganglia and its various connection duvac circuits and its inputs cortical executive circuits and the projection of theirs into various parts of brain amygdala and its various connection thalamic complex with thalamus hypothalamus epithalamus subthalamus and its connection cerebellum and its various connection this is the very common picture of cook the color coded ones are the areas implicated in binge or intoxication phase withdrawal and negative affect phase and preoccupation and anticipation phase we you can see that this is a preliminary attempt the actual picture is much complex i am not going into detailed explanation here because i have to explain behavior addiction in a much broader term this is the basic reward circuit very basic because reward circuit involves much more reward circuit in its total would involve cerebellum would involve various association cortex would involve various brain stem nuclei but still this is the very schematic picture of reward circuit and their inputs these are the two main areas of motivation that control the reward circuit machinery one is misery fleeing this side and its various level of control and reward seeking i would suggest do not remember everything remember that nucleus accumbens is the ultimate common pathway here and through nucleus accumbens both work cell nucleus accumbens and core nucleus accumbens common the perform the common pathway this is how habnular pathway actually control addiction habnular is the principal feedback mechanism for reward circuit there are other feedback mechanism for example the diblen nuclei the hypothalamus epithalamus other parts of epithalamus and subthalamus but habnula so far has got the most interest of all the neuroscientists lateral habnula and medial habnula medial habnula projects to interpeduncular nuclei and that projects to various parts of brain you can see this is another pathway endocannabinoid pathway endocannabinoid pathway is being explored slowly and just like endopioid pathway endocannabinoid pathway plays huge role in addiction in various other body function in immunity in coagulation system and even in pregnancy i would give you a often repeated in interesting fact many of you have seen that during antidepressant treatment your patients conceive more frequently or many of the patients who are having infertility treatment comes to you gets antidepressant and then conceives without any kind of infertility treatment and some of you have, might have wondered why the answer lies probably in endocannabinoid system most of the antidepressants are direct or indirect modulator of endocannabinoid system now endocannabinoid system is responsible for receptive suppression of maternal immunity during fetal implantation to maternal uterus so when endocannabinoid system is enhanced the fetal implantation in maternal uterus gets enhanced and many of the patients who has implantation failure 
would get benefited from antidepressant therapy. That might explain why many of our patients conceive naturally while on antidepressant treatment. Now, endocannabinoid system to ventral tegmental area, prefrontal cortex and nuclear succumbens produces a big role in maintenance of addiction and anticipation. Now, when we talk about addiction, we have to understand that addiction is high motivation for anything coupled with wrong judgment. This wrong judgment part is part of neuroeconomics. Neuroeconomics means when our brain takes various decisions, these decisions are modulated by our learning, our value system. Value system means not social value system, our internal value system, along with various inputs and methods available to us. Brain takes a dynamic decision based on all these things and depending on situation, some of these decisions work, some of these doesn't. And brain learns from it and repeatedly allows the learning to modify the further decision. Sometimes what happens in addiction is brain first take a faulty decision that decisions get brain some tangible in instant reward and then brain goes on seeking that reward repeatedly and addiction is produced. So inherently addiction is also a result of faulty dynamic decision making process and that is part of neuroeconomics. So what is our schematic decision making process? This is a schematic diagram of that. I want all of you to remember this picture. First is representation of problem means whenever brain is facing a situation that is represented as a problem to brain and brain seeks what are the set of feasible action the internal states which says how many actions can be taken and the external states let's say someone is feeling hungry during a meeting so that person would consider the feasible actions of going out of the lecture room or suppressing the anger depending on internal state, whether the person is in a well fed state or not, whether the person is in fasting or not, and whether the external situation allows the person to go out of the state, uh, uh, meeting or not. And based on these, the each of the different action would be valued. Each of the different action would, gi would be given an emotional value, uh, internal value and the external value. And that value would decide for brain which action brain would select and then brain would evaluate the outcome and each of these stage would be learned and would be applied for future action these are the various brain areas that are involved in this process the value judgment can be divided by two parts, reward anticipation or punishment anticipation. Reward anticipation is ventral stratum, punishment anticipation is amygdala and value judgment itself is done by mostly orbitofrontal cortex. Then the person would approach a function or avoid a function. For approach or avoid, go or no go signaling is done by dorsal stratum. Then outcome evaluation would be done by anterior cingulate cortex or frontal cortex. Then reward predicting error, RP is reward predicting error. That whether that would be positive or negative means the anticipation or punishment would be overwhelmed by the reward or not, 
could be calculated by Vendras diagram, and value computation would be done by orbital frontal cortex or anterior cingulate cortex, and then action would be selected by ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and the cognitive control would be provided by anterior cingulate cortex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and this would again be part of value judgment by orbital frontal cortex. That is how our brain takes dynamic decision making. And any problem in any of these areas would give rise to problem of excessive involvement in any action, so called or addiction. So these are the various cognitive impairments in various so called questionable addictive activity. Compulsive sexual behavior has attentional bias. Gambling disorder has motor as well as compulsivity as well as attentional bias. Binge eating disorder has all three. Internet gaming disorder has more attentional bias and impulsivity rather than compulsivity. But again, these are very early results and this has been done on a very specific subpopulation. If we do a large scale trial, these results may involve impairment in all the areas, mean all the cognitive areas, all the behavioral areas, and all the motor areas. So after this, after understanding the pheno uh, external phenotype, the dynamic decision making process of addiction, we come into molecular biology of addiction. Again, I am not elaborating it because if I elaborate it today, it would take three or four hours and the whole CMU would cancel. So for any addiction, nucleus accumbens is the central point. This is this represents the common pathway. I have told it before. So uh, in the nucleus accumbens by incentive stimuli or natural reward, the, the, the it actually mediate the reinforcing effect of drugs of abuse or, or behavior, behavioral. Mean behavior means feeding, drinking, sexual behavior, exploitative locomotion, various other activity, anything that is pleasurable would fall under motivated behavior. So all our so-called behavioral process, behavioral addiction or process addiction would fall under motivated behaviors. Now, mesolimbic process would produce positive reinforcement of that behavior and that substance and motor responses would increase in magnitude and vigor would produce reward event and that would in turn produce more human motivation and more human drive would be there for motivated behavior be it any motivated behavior and all this is produced by some common molecular genetics part and that leads to aberrant behavior. This is true for everything, means anything where motivation is involved, they are the same pathway will follow. So the genes of addiction are also genes of all impulsive act, including suicide. The genes of addiction are also genes of all high functionality part, means it actually part of it is actually part of, part of mania now so if we decide we cannot rather i would say we cannot decide or cannot say these are genes of addiction we should say these are genes which causes sustained motivational behavior in any domain This is actually the central dogma of biology and how we are going about it. We have just understood slightly this part, the genomics. 
we have a long way to go epigenome we don't have much idea of epigenomics transcriptomic proteomics metabolomics we have not much idea about e e these things so have to understand that be it drug this part is true for both drugs and behaviors so any drugs of abuse or abuse or overuse of process any pleasurable process would produce the same thing it would produce various transcriptional change and epigenetic change and ultimately would produce various ways through which some genes would be silenced and ultimately there would be long lasting adaptive change in neuronal function this is a detailed pathway this is how various dopamine receptor nmdi receptor amp receptor they module on sustained stimulation they, they modulate the gene through calcium calcium complex protein kinase citrulline 1 and causes increase in b force and decreases in p force c force and ultimately that causes long lasting change in post synaptic neuron and long term potentiation of learned addictive behavior or behavioral addiction same goes for substance addiction these are the drug activated gene and someday we are actually already trial is going on someday we are planning to block this one delta force delta force b to produce change in addictive behavior so after understanding all these things now we can say we have a definitive understanding of what is behavioral or process addiction it is actually another expression of endophenotype of impulsive compulsive behavior in the spectrum of normal personal behavior to addiction means it's a spectrum the spectrum uh, consists of impulsive compulsive behavior and at one end there is person who is passionate about anything that includes me and that includes most of us who are listening to this webinar because unless you are passionate about something you cannot reach to a position in your chosen profession as we all all have reached to a level in our profession all of us have. so we represent some of us represent normal spectrum then there goes the other ones who are overdoing it and ultimately those who are excessively doing it and who are not able to see without it yeah, excuse me dr Benerji, uh, a little five minutes. Okay. So, okay, the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So, it is the intermediate phenotype, deficient internal control, aka executive circuit dysfunction. Means there is executive circuit dysfunction, and that causes the all the so-called behavioral or process addiction. So it is the first step. All the addicts of so-called substance, they are also behavioral addicts. They are using some other process excessively. Along with that, they are using some substances. They are able to wean themselves off from that substance. They are going to continue one or more behavioral processes as addictive behavior throughout their life. Behavioral addiction is actually the quintessential first step. This is 
the end of concept of endophenotype endophenotype is a intermediate step between genotype and phenotype i am not going into details because i don't have much time but all these addictive behavior are actually endophenotype of addiction and this is how they have general population presence unaffected genetic presence spectrum disorder presence and ultimately presence in disorder so what this discussion tell us about treatment of behavioral addiction process addiction should better be reconfigured as part of compulsive impulsive disorders along with obsessive compulsive spectrum disorder in the full spectrum of normality to addiction the ones doing pathogenic work in any area represent the normal chain and addiction represent substance abuse represent the other end. pharmacotherapy of behavioral addiction if, if based on neurophysiology would be drugs to reduce attentional bias means all the stimulant atomoxetine methylphenidates drugs that reduce impulsive behavior means naltrexone nalmefen the zonaminol and drugs that reduce compulsive behavior means ssrl based on neuroanatomy drugs that increase executive control against stimulant drugs that modulate kappa and new opioid receptor naltrexone nalmefen and various other op uh, partial op uh, opioid agonists and drug that modulate endocannabinoid pathway sadly we only have dronaminol and that is not available in india based on neurogenetics and epigenetics drug that inhibit histone deacetylase histone deacetylase inhibitor is valproate also some other and the epileptics like topiramate cyto in one inhibitors almost we all antipsychotics have cyto in one inhibitor activity but it has its inner inner dangers too because cyto in one inhibition can give rise to metabolic syndrome drugs that promote demethylation and prevent methylation of genome and histone again all other all our so called antipsychotic antidepressants are actually promotes methylation and prevents methylation and hypermethylation drugs that enhance crb and cfos again this would be the antidepressant drugs so called antidepressant drugs psychotherapy is based on neurobiology any any psychotherapy because all psychotherapy is the same they are same they are the same person just wearing different clothes they differ only on mode of administration rest action on brain is same they increase the threat appraisal system and they cause systemic hallucination so uh, the so called placebo pathway so this end i am hoping for some quality interaction thank you very much dr basu okay. Yeah. Please go. Please go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Earlier there was some network issue at my end. Dr. Baskar, thank you very much for the comprehensive presentation on a very complex area. Uh, very important question is asked by Dr. Arvind Brahma. Uh, how neuroeconomics is responsible in compulsive sexual activity? Would you like to respond, sir? Yes. Let me give a stage by stage idea of compulsive state. So, on the compulsive sexual activity, from the neuroeconomics. First, let's see the problem for the human being, be it a male or be it a female, and high sexual desire. So, what would be that person's act actions? compatible sexual partner or any sexual partner now depending on that person's learning that person's previous experience and that person's internal value that person might choose 
a commercial sex worker or that person might choose a extra marital relationship or that person might choose the dedicated partner then depending on that action job would do the preferable activity with the preferable partner and based on that feedback decide whether in future that person would do the function or not means every compulsive sexual activity part person would first start with their designated partner they are let's say if that person is married then the first relationship first sexual relationship where the person would do excessive sexual activity would be either uh, the uh, spouse then if spouse is not available or spouse is not agreeable then that person would choose for a extramarital relationship and if that doesn't work would go for sexual activity then based on these the person would uh, Uh, go for paid sexual activity or uh, marital relationship frequently. So this is how a compulsive sexual action can be deconstructed on neural economic theory. Over to organizers, since we have questions because of paucity of time, as our organizers convey us.